Hey, what's up, Southwind? Last week for our all hands meeting here in Kansas City, I brought in a special guest to really uplift our team and give them a little bit of extra at this time of year. His name is Dennis Grayless. You're going to have an opportunity here to listen about some ways he talked about being elite and how to make every day count. Mr. Grayless is a former Marine who has more experiences in the Marine Corps than I can even fathom. He is currently the JROTC teacher slash coach at Shawnee Mission North High School. And during his time there, they have won over 40 national championships. He epitomizes what it takes to win every single day. So I'm excited for you to take a listen here. Enjoy. To be planted. Yeah, my name is Dennis Grayless. Uh, I'm a retired Marine. I spent uh, 25 years in the United States Marine Corps. Uh, 1980 is when I went into Corps. I retired in 2005. Uh, and uh, went to work at Shawnee Mission North. Uh, I currently teach their junior ROTC program, and I'm a football coach. Uh, and I've been coaching football since the day I got there. Uh, coach Major's brother hired me on. I had the privilege of coaching with Coach Major and Coach Morrell, two great men, and drank a lot of beer. We drank a lot more beer, Coach Morrell and I. <laughs> and the only thing better than Coach Morrell is his brother Landon. But anyway, it was rough. All right, so I, let me say this first. So, so uh, Coach Major sent me a freaking little bit of background on you guys. You know, top 20 franchise, or, or top 20 business. Top three franchise, three of the last freaking 15, 16 years. $10 million in profitability. 30% or 30% profitability, 10 million in revenue. Walk in that door for five minutes, you know what? A blind man can see why. This is an inspired freaking group. So I don't know what my little old ass can do to make you any better, but I will say this as a customer. Freaking two years ago when the freaking this damn COVID shit hit, my wife, I've got a shitload of vices. My wife's got one, she's a hoarder. She is your guy's wheelhouse. <laughs> so, so I convinced her that we had to move crap out of our basement. So I went to your online freaking thing, filled it out, and I'll be damned if, if Coach Majors and Coach Morell didn't call them. They said, yeah, we're going to be over to do it. And I said, you guys going to be over to do it? They said, yeah. So they got over there, set up at the kitchen table for a little bit. I took them down below. They saw the operation, what they had in hand. And within about five minutes, some other dudes came out to start doing the freaking job. Yeah, so anyway, hey, so a little more of an icebreaker. Hey, so, so, you know, Coach said, you know, I was in the military. I wasn't in the military. I was boring. How, how many veterans I got in here? Any vets? What branch of service, sir? Army. I, I apologize. All right. Yeah. <laughs> so, so uh, uh, I was a Marine. And, and Marines take a lot of pride in being Marines. It is a special organization. Um, back in the 1980s, uh, there was a, a joint exercise. Uh, Army against Marine Corps. The Army unit was the 7th. 75th uh, Ranger Regiment. The, the Rangers are freaking elite soldiers. And they're going against the 3rd Battalion, 7th Marines. Uh, was the ground combat element in this exercise out of 29 Palms. So anyway, got in this exercise, and uh, this Ranger company's on patrol in 29 Palms in the California desert. And this little Marines, they spot this little Marine on top of the hill. And so that Army Ranger Company Commander, he says, he sends two of his soldiers. He goes, take that damn Marine off that hill. So those two soldiers go running up that hill. That freaking jarhead runs down the back side of that hill. Scuffle, scuffle, scuffle. Here comes that freaking jarhead, that Marine back on top of that hill. Kind of dusting himself off. I mean, you're the Rangers. You're supposed to be elite freaking soldiers. That freaking company commander's pissed. He sends a fire team, four soldiers. Go take that little son of a bitch off that hill. Here comes those four soldiers running up that hill. That jarhead runs down the back side, no one can see. Scuffle, scuffle, scuffle. Here comes that Marine back up on top of that hill. Now that commander's really freaking pissed. He sends a squad, 13 soldiers, take that Marine off that freaking hill. That Marine runs down that back side, scuffle, 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 and no shit. Here comes the jarhead again. Now that company commander's really pissed. He sends an entire platoon, 39 soldiers, take that Marine off that freaking hill. Jarhead runs down the backside, 
scuffle, scuffle, scuffle. This time a freaking soldier comes crawling back over the top. That ranger crawls back to his company commander. He says, sir, sir, we gotta go back. It's a trap. There's two Marines on the other side of that hill. <laughs> hoorah, hoorah. <laughs> Outstanding. All right, good stuff. All right, so I got a little piece of paper here to keep me on track. Coach said I got about 20 minutes. That's probably about all you can tolerate from me. <laughs> you know, I don't know, like when in a day, I don't think there's any type of cookie cutter thing that makes you win each day. Other than you gotta be tough. You have to be a tough son. Ladies, I'm gonna apologize right now. I say bad lane. I got, I got, you don't spend 25 years in the Marines. You have a little halo on top of your damn head. <laughs> um, you gotta be a tough son of a bitch to win every day. You have to be tough to win every day. And the more success you have and achievement in life, the harder it is to be tough, because you start taking things for granted. So, so how do I? How am I tough? Let me ask you this: How many of you guys? You guys woke up yesterday morning. You had a little snow on your driveway. Anybody have that? Yeah. Okay. How many of you took a shovel out and shoveled the shit, or just drive out? My soldier did. Yeah, that's tough. That's tough. You looked at something. You say, you know what? I did. It ain't a whole lot. I did it because I've been married for 35 years, and you don't talk about a saint. I used to pray for her, I pray to her ass now. <laughs> um, and, she, and I better shovel that driveway for her to get down that driveway when she leaves for work in the morning. Um, but that's, that's kind of being tough, doing things that nobody else is gonna do. And it's a little thing. And I'm a big cliche guy, but I believe in cliches because I've watched them work. You hear a lot of coach talk and this, this, this. I actually take that shit to heart. You know, I played sports when I was high school and I didn't play very well. You know, talking about a place where you can put someone to achieve and achieve greatness. My ass on the football field, where I achieved greatness, I carried the damn coach's cord on his headset by him when he walked on the sideline. I mean, I sucked. I wasn't no stud like freaking Coach Majors taking a team to the national championship game. I meant a freaking dude right there. I was a slap dick. I wasn't very good at all. all right. But I had a good heart and kept working. So you gotta be tough. That's a, that's, a, that's a word you say, but you truly have to be tough. And you're tough in every moment of your life. You must be. I'm 59 damn years old. So I'm not gonna talk to you about anything I've read about or anything. I'm gonna talk to you about things I've experienced in my life. I don't know if there's too many more 59 year olds in this room. The one little part right there is pretty good. Oh, oh, oh. oh, damn, I'm looking over at you and I don't think trees live as long as you. <laughs> <laughs> Shit, his candles cost for his birthday cake, doesn't it? <laughs> so I'm going to tell you things I've noticed in life <coughs> and how I live my life. And maybe it's something you can, how I try to live my life. Because all of us fail. And all of us fell off. Um, and if you're a Christian, there's only one guy that, that didn't fail. And, and he was on this planet 2000. 22 years ago. The rest of us are made of flesh and blood, and we're going to make mistakes. And we hope our good outweighs our bad when judgment day comes. Roadmap for me. Grew up in Indiana, Gerald, Indiana. My dad was a truck driver. Uh, grew up in the freaking depression. Dropped out of high school in the eighth grade in 1937 to go work uh, to help his family. Dad was a veteran. Uh, eighth grade education, smartest man I ever knew. My dad. I know a lot of guys say that, but my father, that's true. We didn't have a lot of money, uh, so, so what you were going to do, uh, you were going to freaking have to earn. There were no freaking loans back then, and if there were, my family could not have taken out a loan to go to college, for me to go to college. What was my options? I was going to join the Marine Corps. I'm going to join the Marine Corps and uh, want to be a cop. Can't be a cop here 21. So I'm 17 years old, 1980. Let's join the Corps. Best decision of my life. Three core values in the United States Marine Corps that have, that have set me on my path in life. Honor, courage, and commitment. Three words every day I try to apply in my daily life. Honor. Honor's integrity. Honor's giving a man 
your word and sticking to it. When it's not easy, you give that man your word, that person your word, you're there constantly for them. And if you can be a person of honor and people see that, it makes it easy to win every day. I can't figure out a way to slide out of this. It's not the right thing to do. Number two, courage. In the Marine Corps, there's two types of courage, physical courage and moral courage. Physical courage is easy for Marines. For most, most men, I would say physical courage is easy. By the looks of this group in here, I suspect there's some brawlers in this freaking room. There ain't no freaking dude sipping wine with their freaking pinky up in the damn air. So it's like a beer drinking, whiskey freaking drinking crowd. My kind of Hell freaking no. operation. Jeff? No shit, no slappies in here. No Air Force guys, right? <laughs> <laughs> We're freaking getting after it. So physical courage is not the challenge. And good leadership will drive you through physical courage. Moral courage is the challenge in our lives. Moral courage, doing the right things. Doing the right things when nobody's watching. Not making an excuse about what I'm trying to do or legitimizing something that I shouldn't be doing. Having the moral courage to do what's right by your teammates in this room. Not to cheat, not to lie, not to steal. The moral courage to do the right things every day. And it's challenging. It's extremely challenging. And the last of those uh, core values are commitment. Commitment is truly the essence of winning every day when you are committed. You wake up in the morning, man, I just don't feel like getting out of bed today. Well, if you've got a great team and you've got a great culture in an organization, commitment should come easy to you because you don't want to let your brother down. You don't. You've got to freaking be there. Because if your ass ain't there, some other crew's got to take your freaking job. You're not winning that day. Well, damn, I did a great job yesterday. Good. I just talked about all the accomplishments your freaking company's had. You know what? On January freaking 7th, 2022, who gives a shit? You ain't done anything right now. I can tell you I was the greatest Marine Corps drill instructor the Marine Corps ever had in 1987. What the frick difference does that make in 2022? What the hell is this old bastard doing today to still be relevant to make a difference? That's got to be your mindset every day. If you want to win every freaking day, I got to get my ass up, strap it on, not look at any press clippings I got or what somebody says about me. I got to strap it on and bust my ass. And you should have that internally driving you. But if you don't, if you're a selfish person, and we are built to be selfish, not selfless, you are built to be selfish. And we live in a society that drives you to be selfish. We live in a society that you just don't have any freaking patience. You go to the freaking McDonald's and goddamn order a number two, if you pull up to the window and that freaking bag of food ain't out in 30 seconds, you're pissed. It was 30 freaking seconds. It ain't a big deal. You guys could Google up Dennis Credits right now and you'd see several freaking mug shots and post offices of my ass. But you can find that out real quick, right? Everything's instant to you. Winning every day is not instant. Life is not instant. Sustained achievement is every day forgetting what happened yesterday. If you guys won yesterday, something else I do. Kind of corny. I had to adjust my fire a little bit this past year. I used to have a calendar by my bed. And every day I would say, did I win or lose today? Because if we get wrapped up down the road, we lose focus on what Coach Saban says is the process. The process of being good. So every day, I say, did Dennis Grayless win? And as an old man, um, what, 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 how do I win each day? First, I've got to be a good husband. Then I've got to be a good father. I've got one daughter. She's married to a wonderful man. They've been married for 11 years. They have two grand, grandsons. They have two sons. I have two grandsons. And we got, I'm not supposed to let this out, but grandma's real happy. We got a little girl uh, on the way. So ain't nothing better than being a freaking grandparent, man. 
That shit is fun. Because you go over there, spoil the shit out of those kids, rub those little boys up, mom's pissed, why you got them hitting each other, grandpa, why you letting them jump on you and hit you? Because I don't want no freaking sissy or a goddamn grandson, that's why. <laughs> right? And then you just turn them back over. Well, Mom and Dad, they got to deal with that shit. Me and Grandma go home and have a good time. <laughs> so, uh, and we still get after you. Freaking hit it all with my ass. It's, all right. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about, brother. You <laughs> right, here we go. I told you girls were going to be rough. I apologize. God damn. All right, so I got to be a good husband. I've got to be a good father. I've got to be a good grandfather. I got to be a good teacher at Shawnee Mission North. And I gotta be a coach. And then a good teammate for the guys in the PE department with me and the coaches I coached with. So I got six elements every day I look at. They say, how did I do? And I try to judge how did I win in those categories. So at the end of the day, before I go to sleep, and I go to bed about eight o'clock at night, um, I put a W and L on that thing. So so my wife got pissed uh, right before Christmas because I was tallying up 365 day games. You got 365 game schedule each year. So I'm tallying up, and I got all kinds of W's in there. And my wife said, your ass, you're not playing the same schedule I see you playing. Because <laughs> you're losing a hell of a lot more than your W. So now what I'm doing now, I got a desktop calendar at work, and I damn, I feel good about my record. <laughs> it's going good. But it helps me stay focused on what is important, which is today, which is what you've got to really focus on, to stay on target. Um, to be tough, to win every day. Don't make excuses and don't complain. You know, you know the only, everybody, excuse, everybody's got one. Just like assholes, everybody's got one and they all stink. The other thing is like telling people problems. You got people in your life that you know and they're always talking about their damn problems. 90% of the people you tell about problems, they don't give a shit you got. And the other 10% are glad you got the problem to begin with. So why the hell tell anybody about your problems? Suck it up and move on and do what you need to be able to do. Other thing, if you want to be great, you want every day, something I tell my high school buddies, and this goes all the way back to my, my father telling me this in 1976. My dad said, son, if I want to know about you, all I got to know who your three best friends are. So this, this resonates more with these teenagers, maybe than this group, but it also applies to grown men and grown women. Who are your three best friends? If your three best friends are lazy pieces of crap and not motivated, doing criminal shit, doing the wrong stuff, that's what you're gonna do. But if you got three best friends that are really great, and that, that might be the only smart thing I've ever done in my life, is surround myself with really good people and a great wife. A great wife, 35 years, that woman. Uh, unbelievable. Uh, talk about she's my best friend. I was playing golf with this guy named George Salas. He used to be our athletic director. We get done playing golf, and normally we get done playing golf, I'm freaking tossing some back. And I don't drink for the taste of it. When I drink, my ass drinks to get drunk. <laughs> uh, so we're getting ready to get done with the golf, but I had to go home. And I told George, I said, George, I gotta go home. Celia needs me for this. And he goes, come on, Tampere. I said, no, I go home, she's my best friend. And she and I said, he goes, no, she's not your best friend. I said, no, my wife's my best friend. She said, she's not your best friend, I'm gonna prove it to you. He goes, coach, when you get home, I want you to freaking lock your wife in the trunk of your car and lock the dog in the trunk of your car. Come back in an hour and see which one of them's happy to see you. Then you'll find out who the hell you're going to spend. So obviously, freaking that works. Uh, it is a good one. This is kind of a slow group, I think, right here. <laughs> Some of these bastards are thinking, yeah, he really locked his freaking pipe up. Uh, so the last thing I would tell you about it being great, it's a story. Um, and being winning every day, you must be selfless. You must be selfless. And being selfless takes a lot of out of you. You've got to be there for other people. You have to be there for other people. 
I, and that's going to require you to spend a lot of time helping other people. But if you can be selfless, just like if you can be committed and do the right things, and you get there and you're always working your ass off, other people see that. Now other people are going to help you. When you're selfish, I damn, the one thing I, I believe I'm going to be good, I pray that I've helped as many people as I can in my life, that when they plant my ass, they won't have any problem finding enough people to carry that casket to the gravesite. They'll probably be happy to get my ass planted. But, <laughs> but uh, if you're selfless, you can do great things. So I'm going to tell you a story about selflessness. And when you think you get it. Now I'm going to take you to, to a period of time, uh, 1966. Um, this is a story that I got from our 31st Commandant of the Marine Corps, the late Charles Kulak. In the spring of 1966, we're in Vietnam, and the 324th uh, North Vietnamese Division, this is the same division in uh, 10 years earlier at Dien Bien Phu, had freaking annihilated the French. The 324th North Vietnamese Infantry Division was up on the Chinese border. China and North Vietnam have been lifelong enemies. So they moved the 324th down to the DMZ, the military zone which separates North Vietnam and South Vietnam. The Marine Corps is going to defend in zone, defeat in zone, that 324th uh, NVA division. And they devised a plan called Operation Tasty that's going to uh, insert 11 Marine Infantry Battalions up along the DMZ and block and defeat those guys in place. General Krulak, at the time, is the first lieutenant. He's the company commander of Golf Company, 2nd Battalion, 1st Marines, 23 years old. A company of Marines is 200 Marines. Uh, four platoons, three, three platoons and one weapon platoon. A platoon of Marines is 39 Marines. A squad of Marines is 13 Marines. So in June of 1966, Golf Company 2-1, Hilo inserts into a spot about 2,000 uh, meters from the north Vietnam border from the DMZ. So when they land, they land in their LZ. The LZ is nothing more than what stuff we can relate. It's like six football fields long and about three football fields wide. <clears throat> so he inserts his company, and no sooner do they insert that they immediately become under, come under indirect fire, mortar fire, artillery fire, and direct weapon fire, <clears throat> 50 cows, and small arms fire. Along the east side of that landing zone, and there was just old dried up rice paddies, is what, what the LZ was. There was a dried up creek bed. So two of his platoons were able to get under the cover of that dried up creek bed. But his first platoon wasn't. The first platoon was dropped off right in the kill zone. So three squads of 13 make up a platoon of 39. One of the squads is pinned down directly in the line of a North Vietnamese 50 caliber machine gun. And within seconds, General Kulak has four of his Marines dead. And this is an old bastard. This, this is a 23-year-old young man. Four of his Marines are dead. And he knows that if he doesn't do something, Within a matter of seconds, minutes now, that gun's going to go to the other nine members of that freaking squad, and then to the other two squads in that platoon, and within minutes, he's going to have 39 freaking dead Marines. So he gets on the freaking radio. He gets on his radio, his radio office right there, and he tells another one of the platoon commanders, a guy named Ollie North, was the second lieutenant at the time. You might, if you follow news, Lieutenant Colonel Oliver North, been a big deal after he got out of the court. Um, but he's one of his platoon commanders. He tells Lieutenant Nord, move your ass up that creek bed, this is Tactics 101, to get up on the flank so we can flank this son of a bitch. He has his other two platoons set down a base of fire. I mean, it's freaking Tactics 101. So as he's on the freaking phone, making those other platoon commanders move, his 
radio operator taps him on the shoulder. He says, look at Lance Corporal Grable. It's 1966. Lance Corporal Grable is a young black man from Crump, Tennessee. Lance Corporal Grable had gotten up John Wayne style, not like we teach in the Marine Corps. M16 on his hip started flying towards that machine gun nest. And he was zigging back and forth. General Kulak tells the story, you could see the freaking rounds tracking him. And as soon as those rounds would get close, just like a broken film runner, he'd cut back the other way. And then boom, 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 he'd cut back the other way. For every 15 years, yards he went laterally, he went three forward. Then all of a sudden, boom, picked up and dropped like a freaking dish rag. Obviously hit. But in that time that that young Marine maneuvered under fire, the rest of the guys in his squad and the other two squads in that first platoon were able to get to cover of that creek bed. He did not know that. So now everything's ready to go. He's down. The maneuver element is in place to, to launch the maneuver elements of Green Star Cluster. That CO is going to pop off the base of fire, moves off the target, so your maneuver element can sweep across. He fires that freaking star cluster, and this time the radio operator taps him on the shoulder, but he can't say anything. He just taps him and says, points out in that field. That's a couple of had gotten back to his feet. And this time, only like Marines freaking do, he shouldered his weapon like he was taught. He good, got good sight alignment. He got good sight picture. And he walked down the line of fire of that 50 caliber machine gun. Walked down the line of fire of that machine gun. The assault's over. Five minutes later, uh, General Kulak, then Lieutenant Kulak, says he got up to the machine gun nest. And he says, as God is my witness, there were nine dead North Vietnamese soldiers in that trench. And laying over the barrel of that 50 caliber machine gun was Lance Corporal Grable. And he says, Marines pulled him off that gun, as only Marines can do. And they laid him down, and he had five entry wounds. They opened his flak jacket, 50 caliber flak jacket, ain't gonna stop the 50 caliber round. It's an anti armor weapon, it's not a freaking net for personnel. Five entry wounds into that young Marine's chest. Could not tell where they went out because he had no back. Six months later, General Krulak then Lieutenant Kulak rotates back to the United States. He has to go to a ceremony in Washington, D.C., where Lance Corporal Grable's wife is going to receive the Navy Cross. The Navy Cross is, a, if you're a sailor or a Marine, that's the second highest award of valor you can receive, only below the Medal of Honor. And in Lance Corporal Grable's wife's arms was his little boy. That he'd never seen, except for a Polaroid picture. So you sit here at, at, at 9851 Widmer, you say, well, damn, that's a neat story, coach. What's that got to do with us? What's that got to do with this freaking team right here? It's got everything to do with us. I want you to think about the time. It's 1966. This was a black man raised in the South. Couldn't even buy a fucking hamburger at McDonald's. He gave his life for his fellow Marine. He didn't give a shit what they looked like. He didn't give a shit who they prayed to. He was their brother, and he gave his life. So you want to be great? If you think you're selfless, if you think you're tough, if you think you're giving everything to this organization, you think about that young man in the summer of 1966 on that DMZ.
That's selflessness. That's being a teammate. That's being committed. That's winning every freaking day. That's giving all you got. And the last thing I tell you this. In your life, you won't be happy for an hour, go buy your ass a steak and eat it. You won't be happy for a day, go fishing or go play golf. You won't be happy for a week, go on a cruise. To me, going on a cruise is freaking like freaking being in jail, but you got a chance to drown. <laughs> you won't be happy for a month, buy a new car. You won't be happy for a year, win the lottery. You won't be happy for a freaking lifetime, make a difference in other freaking people's life every day that you goddamn live. You understand me? Give me two claps and a Ric Flair. <laughs> <laughs>